Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am pleased to welcome you to the Baker Institute's Civic Scientist Lecture Series event with Drs. David Baltimore and Alice Wong. Both have led highly distinguished careers, and we are privileged uh, to have them with us. Dr. Wong recently served as president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a position her husband, Dr. Baltimore, held previously. Dr. Baltimore won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1975. Both now hold faculty positions at the California Institute of Technology. They truly uh, fit the definition of the civic scientist. What Baker Institute senior fellow Dr. Neil Lane has defined as a scientist or engineer who uses his or her knowledge and skills to help bridge the gap between science and society. I would like to thank those who helped make tonight's prog uh, program possible, the Weiss School of Natural Sciences and Dean Dan Carson, uh, Ms. Janice Hartrick of the JWC JKH Family Foundation and Shell Oil Company through our Shell Distinguished uh, Lectures uh, series. In addition, I would especially like to thank Neil Lane and Dr. Kirsten Matthews, who lead the Baker Institute Science and Technology Policy Program, which is sponsoring uh, this evening's uh, event. Uh, the mission of the Science and Technology Policy Program is to engage policymakers and scientists in substantive dialogue with the hope that policy will more accurately reflect and be more consistent with current scientific knowledge. Our program organizes timely workshops, lectures, conferences, and also conducts important and relevant research, including on stem cell policy, science education, science advice to policymakers, international collaboration, biomedical research and policy, and the environment. We also co-sponsor joint projects on energy, information technology, and space policy. The Civic Scientist Lectures are a series of talks by leading scientists from around the world who have influenced public policy. The lectures seek to encourage scientists to promote science and technology beyond the laboratory. Tonight's discussion will focus on the role scientists play in proving the public's and the policymakers' understanding of science, as well as the positive role that science can have on international relations. Previous civic scientist speakers include Dr. Jay Lubchenko, Administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric uh, Administration, uh, our, do our Dr. Bob Curl and Sir Harry Croto, two Nobel, Nobel Prize winners in chemistry, and Dr. Bruce Alberts, the Editor-in-Chief of Science, one of the world's most prestigious scientific uh, journals. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Neil Lane, who is a true civic scientist himself, an eminent physicist and scholar. Neil is the Baker Institute's senior fellow in science and technology policy, the Malcolm Gillis University professor at Rice and professor of physics and astronomy. Under President Bill Clinton, Neil served as science advisor at the White House and director of the National Science Foundation. He was previously provost and professor of physics at Rice University. He has had so many positions, there's not a new one we can throw at him. He's been awarded many medals and, and distinctions. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and numerous other honorary professional associations. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, help welcome me, welcome Neil Lane to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, for the introduction. Uh, my son introduced me one time and said, my father just can't seem to hold a job. <laughs> one of the great uh, pleasures of being at the Baker Institute is the opportunity to work with Ambassador Edward Gerigian. He knows more about world affairs, Middle East in particular, than pretty much anybody on the planet. And I think, as you know, under uh, his leadership, Baker Institute has risen in stature and ranking uh, to be among uh, many of the world's great uh, policy institutes. I want to add my welcome to all of you and my thanks to the Weiss School of Natural Sciences, 
to Janice Hartrick and the uh, JWCJKH Family Foundation and Shell Oil through its Distinguished Lecture Series for their support in making these lectures possible. This evening, I have the special privilege of introducing two of America's most distinguished scientists, as Ed has told you earlier. They are indeed civic scientists, uh, Dr. David Baltimore and Dr. Alice Wong. Our lead-off speaker in tonight's doubleheader is Dr. David Baltimore, one of the most influential biologists of his time, by any measure. Dr. Baltimore has led a distinguished career in both scientific research and scientific leadership. He has credited his interest in biology as beginning during the summer as a high school student working with research biologists in the Jackson Laboratory of Maine. If only he'd worked in a physics laboratory, but history is what it is. The world is better, I think, for, uh, for what actually occurred. Uh, David went on to graduate, uh, graduate from Swarthmark College and earned his doctorate from Rockefeller University. His career took him to the Salk Institute and MIT, where he was coaxed into combining scientific administration with research. And in 1982, he was named the founding director of MIT's Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research, where he remained for eight years. He then became president of Rockefeller Institute in 1990, and following that, served as president of Caltech from 1997 to 2006, where he is currently the Robert Andrews Millikan Professor of Biology and President Emeritus. He served as president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2007. David Baltimore also has been a major figure in Washington, for example, helping to create the national science policy uh, for recombinant DNA research was not an easy matter, some of you familiar with that history will recall. He also served as head of the National Institutes of Health AIDS Research Committee and was co-chair of the committee that developed the national strategy for AIDS. As Ambassador Drugian mentioned, David received the 1975 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his discovery of reverse transcriptase. Physicists said that out loud, I mean, all in one <laughs> go which is an enzyme required for the replication of retroviruses, such as HIV. He's made several other breakthrough discoveries in virology, immunology, which would take too much time to list. Among his other honors, David received the 1999 National Medal of Science from President Clinton for his far-reaching fundamental discoveries for excellence in building scientific institutions and in fostering communication between scientists and the general public. I had the pleasure of witnessing this event which took place when I was in the White House. Also had the wonderful opportunity to visit Caltech with President Clinton when uh, David was president and uh, Clinton was there to give a speech on the importance of science and to announce major increases <coughs> to boost re research funding, which in fact he did in the fiscal year 2001 budget. That included, but it wasn't just, the National Nanotechnology Initiative, which is so recently celebrated its 10th anniversary. David continues to mentor students and fellows and conduct research through the Baltimore Laboratory at Caltech. Much of his research is focused on studying cellular mechanisms that have implications for developing new therapies for AIDS. Uh, tonight, he will speak about the crisis in health research and its implications for the public. Please welcome Dr. David Baltimore. Thank you, Neil, for that very kind introduction. And uh, hello to all of you here. I've had a wonderful day, I might say, meeting faculty and students, uh, particularly undergraduate students uh, at Rice. Uh, and it, it has really been a heartwarming experience to see um, the sort of cream of Texas life. So I gave a sort of pessimistic title to this, The Crisis in Health Research. And it may seem odd, because by many measures, health research is extremely healthy. Uh, there is more literature coming out every day than anyone could possibly read. And to take one example, particular genes are being associated with all sorts of diseases and that comes from the fact that we now know all the genes in the human genome. So we gotta look at subtler measures to begin to wonder how well we're doing. 
Let's, let's consider the career of a budding biomedical scientist. So that individual started perhaps in research even in high school. And I, we were at a high school today here where quite a number of the kids said they were doing research either at MD Anderson or somewhere else or wanted to do research. And then continued on in college, often spending every summer in research and maybe much of the school year, particularly in his, last couple of, his or her last couple of years of, of schooling. And then maybe our individual took off a year to sort of catch his or her breath, and then went on to graduate school or to an MD-PhD program and spent perhaps six years on a PhD or nine years in an MD-PhD program. And then the individual is now roughly 30. And then maybe he or she did a five-year postdoctoral fellowship, or if an MD did an internship and residency and fellowship and then a postdoc for maybe 10 years. And now our individual is between 35 and 40, probably pushing 40, and finally able to take up an independent position as an assistant professor someplace or in a research institute and by this time, our individual probably has a family and a house. And if he or she is lucky, another breadwinner in the family. And NIH grants are hard to get at this stage in your career. So our assistant professor has to get institutional support and charitable support, charitable support for the first few years to build up enough material to support an application to NIH. And then maybe he or she gets their first grant, age 38 to 43 on my scenario. And you know what? The average first NIH grant, this is statistically true, goes to someone 42 years old. So I'm not making this up. This is the real life of a scientist today. Now, we used to believe that one is most creative in biomedical science in the years before 40. Not to say you can't be creative later, but anecdotal evidence favors the younger investigator. I, perhaps, as one example, did the work for which I won the Nobel Prize when I was 32. And by age 42, I was developing the Whitehead Institute, which I ran for that next decade. I'd already published 220 papers by that time. And there are many other problems. I mean, this is, this is, this is not a life to look forward to. Um, but the review panels of NIH now consist very much, I hope I don't insult anybody, of mediocre scientists, not the cream of the crop. There's an old saying that in a review process, Grade A scientists will choose A plus scientists, and grade B scientists will choose C scientists. So the best people are not being recognized. And that's the, what we all have to look forward to. And, and I can tell you that the complaints that I hear about the review process go very widely. OK, so much for people. How about money? Well, starting over a decade ago, at the request of President Clinton, Congress decided to double the NIH budget, and that was successfully finished under President Bush. So what was the consequence? It's a budget now of about $30 billion a year. However, once Congress doubled the budget, it apparently felt that it had done what job it needed to do, and our representatives have flat-funded NIH for more than five years. Meanwhile, the response in the outer community of the institutions funded by NIH was to increase their size, building new buildings, starting new units, hiring new people. They easily doubled their capacity. Flat funding is actually a cut 
because every year there's inflation and there's an increasing high cost of research. So we have seen over the last five years an increasingly competitive funding atmosphere with success levels for funding a grant plummeting to single digit percentages. NIH is formally or informally limiting the amount that any single investigator can be granted. Meanwhile, NIH continues to fund much of the salaries of its investigators, relieving the universities of the need to pay its personnel. So we have highly trained people ready to expand their horizons, being seriously squeezed as to what they can achieve. I go to the occasional scientific meeting, and I am amazed that investigators who are my contemporaries, and that means they're old, are still the speakers. The one place where I can find the younger generation dominating is the truly spectacular group of scientists who are supported by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And they are people I'd never met before because they're much younger than I am. HHMI, as it is called, provides a few percent of the biomedical science funded by NIH, but it only bets on the best. And it funds on a different basis than NIH, by retrospective review of accomplishment rather than by proposed future experiments. Basically, it bets on the best athletes, not those who present themselves in the best wrapper. That NIH does not fund this way is one of its deepest faults. And HHMI provides funds on quite a lavish scale, encouraging their investigators to think big. It is no surprise that a disproportionate number of the pathfinding papers in biomedical research come from the laboratories of HHMI investigators. I should put a footnote in here. When I say things like that, I am not basing it on careful scientific evaluation, but rather on my impression, uh, and I admit that I don't have the data, but I'm not sure anybody else does either. So what is the consequence of all this? It is quite honestly hard to be sure. When I visit an institution and meet with the trainees, I do find a depressed atmosphere. They seem trapped in the endless training process, unsure of what they're going to do with all their training. I find it hard to see the joy in science that I remember as a trainee. I certainly can't find the optimism that I and my contemporaries had when we were entering a new and exciting world of science. In the post-Sputnik era, when I trained, we even knew that the country wanted us to be scientists so that we could compete successfully against the Russians. Today, we train Chinese in our laboratories because we can't find sufficient numbers of bright American students who want to make a career in science and after I've told you what a career means, who can blame them? Why is biomedical research important to the United States? Maybe it would be fine if the knowledge that was gained was gained elsewhere in other countries and in other institutions, and then we wouldn't have to pay for it. But knowledge is knowledge. We know about it because it's published. So that heretical thought uh, led me to think about why we do need to maintain biomedical science in the United States. And I can come up with three or four reasons. To fuel the biotech industry, to allow translational research to happen in the United States, for having the expertise to draw upon in the United States, and for national prestige and the sense that knowledge is one of America's finest products. So let me consider each of those. Biotechnology. We have been the leading country in the support of biomedical research since World War II. Because we invested so heavily in discovery, the biotechnology industry was born in the US and has prospered here. Every other country has been a follower of our leads. Actually, most of the important discoveries in modern biology were made in the United States we invented recombinant DNA technology, which is at the heart of biotechnology. I even helped a little with my discovery of reverse transcriptase. Neil, you said that very well. Uh, a central component of the armamentarium of biotechnology. Until recently, we have been the leaders of, this of the revolution in pharmaceutical production. 
but we're in danger of losing that edge. The venture capital companies are investing less in startup firms. It's now a fight to amass the capital needed to get through even phase two trials. Translational research. That's the buzzword of the moment. It's got a lot of play in Washington. It involves taking discoveries made in the basic research laboratory and translating them into clinically relevant procedures. Obviously, it requires the continuum of activities from basic research through application, and all of those must be strong and local for the translational process to succeed. I myself am now involved in such work, and I know that it is the most difficult thing you can do, but also it tests the whole system of research in a country or an institution. It also can have a huge payoff for a country because this is what leads to new medical products that fuel the development of the pharmaceutical industry. The third topic was expertise because so many of the relevant discoveries are made in the United States. If anyone in our country needs to draw on a deep font of expertise for technical advice at companies, for patent disputes, for explaining to the public what's happening in the field. There have always been people available in the United States. If we lose that edge, we lose that resource. And national prestige, it has always been a matter of great national pride that our science leads the world. We get the lion's share of the Nobel Prizes almost every year. If we were not the leaders in science, we would suffer a serious diminution in our pride as a nation. All right, to turn to a different perspective. In the United States, we train many foreign scientists. As I said, we need them. They come here as students and postdoctoral fellows. They're trained in the latest technology, and they learn the most current ideas in, in United States laboratories. Should we be training foreign scientists? So there are three sides to that question. Yes, because we need the hands. Yes, because we get the pick of the crop to stay in the United States in our universities. No, because we're creating our own competitors. Should we be doing that? So the argument that we need foreign scientists to do the experiments in our laboratories is incontrovertible. We simply do not have sufficient interest among U.S. citizens going into experimental biology. The U.S. citizens who go into science are disproportionately the offspring of immigrants, and so it's not a, a continuous um, wellspring. In my own laboratory, I have many Chinese scientists and the children of Chinese immigrants. Without these people, American science might be a mere shell. The second argument, again, certainly true, is that by having these foreign scientists in our laboratories, we get to ask the best of them to stay in the United States. They stay on as faculty in our universities, as scientists in our companies, and often they do stay, and they've made huge contributions to the status of science, of our science. And by training them in English, we make certain that they will always look to the United States for interaction and support, so even if they return to their companies, they'll send their best young people to come to our laboratories to work. But by training all of these foreign scientists, we are creating our own competitors. They know what we know. They are as good scientists as we are. And now their countries are providing increasing resources for their scientific activities, and that's something new. We even helped them set up their laboratories abroad. The Howard Hughes Medical Institute just awarded 28 fellowships to biomedical scientists who have recently returned to their home countries. These grants are meant to help these young people get started in their own laboratories. Seven of those were in China. Now that's, you know, it's all wonderful. But you do have to ask the difficult question. And I called the talk the crisis in health research, and I hope I've laid out the argument that there is a crisis from a number of points of view, people, resources, institutional behavior, national need. But I do want to emphasize 
that we continue to produce great science, and we are certainly not in an irreversible decline. Let me finish by discussing some of the positive signs and where they come from. In the 1990s, the government money, uh, with government money, we sequenced the human genome. Some of the funding came from the Wellcome Trust in Britain to fund their important contribution, but the largest part of the work was funded by the National Institutes of Health and done here um, in the Whitehead Institute at Washington University in St. Louis and at Baylor here. This has turned out to be an unalloyed success. We have learned much more than we ever could have expected finding new kinds of molecules encoded in the genome, finding the genes that lead to disease, knowing just exactly what are the genes that contribute to normal physiology. The story of the Genome Project shows that NIH can act creatively, responding to the opportunities made available by new technology and new ideas. But NIH does this so very rarely, and it is difficult for anything to creative creative to come from there in the present straightened circumstances. That being said, I should note that my own translational work, although originally funded by the Gates Foundation, is now funded through contracts from NIH, and they've been very supportive of some quite unorthodox ideas. Now, Eric Lander was the leader of the genome effort at the Whitehead Institute, and he was the lead author on the papers that described the genome. He used his lead position to imagine into existence a new type of biomedical research institution and convinced a Los Angeles philanthropist, Eli Broad, to provide first $100 million, and that's now grown to $600 million, to start and then endow the Broad Institute. Broad's mandate is to follow up on the implications of the genome work for human health. Broad has made many, many exciting discoveries, has empowered a whole generation of young faculty at Harvard and MIT, and has demonstrated that there are new ways to organize science different from the sort of big man focus of most universities. Broad is a story about the personal entrepreneurship of a single individual, the flexibility of US institutions to provide a home for new styles of science, and the willingness of wealthy Americans to invest in enterprises that serve the public good. This is where the excitement is today in biomedical science, and there are many other such stories. The most remarkable dates back some 20 years when the Howard Hughes Medical Institute sold the Hughes Aircraft Company and came into a fortune that now amounts to $16 billion. This endowment is dedicated to supporting biomedical science and, as I said, funds some of the best science being done today. Another private organization that's been funding research is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Although the majority of their funding is for the delivery of health care, they do support scientific research with their $33.5 billion endowment. Stories of lesser amounts but of great contributions include James Stowers, who provided $2 billion to start the Stowers Institute of Medical Research in Kansas City, Missouri, which has become a highly honored institution working in developmental biology. Paul Allen, who has been both the philanthropist and the entrepreneur for the production of the Allen Brain Atlas, a remarkable compendium of information about what genes are active in what populations of brain cells. And I shouldn't forget Jack Whitehead, who funded the Whitehead Institute in 1982, when private philanthropy on the scale of $100 million was virtually unknown since the days of Carnegie and Rockefeller. Terry Reagan of Cambridge, Massachusetts has recently given $100 million to set up an institute devoted to finding an AIDS vaccine. The Stanley Foundation has just put up $100 million for research on the genetic underpinnings of mental disease, work at the Broad Institute, and I know of a very wealthy hedge fund entrepreneur right now thinking about a multi-billion dollar fund for basic research. We could add to this list the many funded research, uh, the many who have funded research focused on particular diseases, led by Michael Milken, who personally activated research 
on prostate cancer with his foundation's activities. This kind of public support for science is something that's only American, it's not found abroad, and is one of America's special weapons in the search for knowledge. But we should not, we have to put all of this in perspective. They sound like amazing sums of money, and they are, particularly when one has the advantage of that largesse. But the $30 billion from NIH dwarfs all of that. The equivalent endowment at a 5% payout would be $600 billion. So that puts even the Gates Foundation into perspective. Without reform of NIH, this money will continue to underperform the remarkable impact it could and should have. The bottom line here is that America still leads the world in biomedical research, but the enterprise is severely strained. We need the kind of fresh thinking now supported mainly by private wealth. We need to bring back the excitement that many of my generation felt when we went into science. And all of this is possible, but will not happen without, without creative ideas, commitment to change, and political acumen. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. We're going to take questions together up here after uh, Alice's presentation. So our second speaker tonight is Alice Wong. Dr. Wong is an eminent virologist and a strong advocate for women in science. She's currently a senior faculty associate in biology at Caltech and recent past president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr. Wong has received numerous awards for her research in microbiology and currently serves on the boards of trustees of multiple institutions, including Johns Hopkins University, AAAS, and the Keystone Center. Dr. Wang was born in China and grew up in the United States. She received her bachelor's, master's, and PhD from Johns Hopkins University and completed her postdoctoral work at the Salk Institute and MIT, working with David. She conducted groundbreaking research on viral infection, including her work on the vesicular stromatitis virus, VSV, which I understand later helped lead to the discovery of reverse transcriptase. Because of Dr. Wong's extensive work on VSV, the virus has become a model for research. So if you ask him if they've got their favorite virus, I think <laughs> Alice has her favorite virus, and many would agree. Dr. Wong became full professor of microbiology and molecular genetics at Harvard in, I think, 1979, and was director of the Laboratories of Infectious Diseases at the Children's Hospital in Boston. At one point in her career, she also served as a dean of New York University. Alice has held numerous prominent leadership positions in medicine, science, and technology, and has consulted on science policy for both U.S. and foreign governments, including China, Taiwan, Singapore. As her excellence in scientific work has shown, uh, Alice is passionate about investigating viruses and their growth mechanisms, but she is also passionate about policy issues on education, science, and technology, particularly using science to build international bridges, improving science education, and maximizing access to science for diverse populations, especially women and minorities. I had the pleasure of participating in an excellent workshop focused on scientific collaboration in the Asian Pacific region that she put together during her time as AAAS president. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alice Wong. Good evening. Neil, thank you for that generous introduction. This evening, I'd like to focus on the second part of the title, and I'm not sure if you can read it, Science Diplomacy in the Global Environment, Compete or Collaborate with a New Asia. I began to observe science capacity in Asian countries since the 70s. 
I have participated as a consultant in the new Asia, and by that I mean China, Korea, India, and Singapore. Given my unique vantage point, I want to share my observations and analysis with you this evening. My assumptions are that there are critical, complex, global problems that need the most capable persons worldwide to help solve them, and that in innovation will be necessary to solving these problems, and also that innovation will be crucial to the future prosperity of individual nations as well as for the world. And the important question for us tonight is, do we as a nation collaborate or compete with the new Asia on science and technology? My answer is obviously that we need to do both. But to do so effectively is not without its challenges. I want to focus on these challenges. But before I begin, let's just take a quick look at the distribution of the world's population. It should become immediately obvious to you that the majority of the people are from Asia or in Asia, and they make up a large part of our world population. If we look at those who are in research and compare those in 2002 to 2007 uh, in the United States and in China, the numbers are such that it's obvious that there's been an increase in the percentage of individuals within the population in China who have joined the research workforce. And since China is somewhere four to five times larger in population than the United States, this is a tremendous increase in research workforce. Can China overwhelm the United States in productivity, or can these researchers be recruited to help solve important global problems? I posit that we must recruit them and into collaborations uh, with us and with other countries. But is this realistic? Let's take a look at the new Asia. And really, this leaves out Japan. It's basically demographically youthful. The people are very energetic. And they believe that science and technology is essential to progress and national success. There is also the willingness to invest in education and in research. And finally, all these countries do have something in common that is a strong tradition of respect for intellectual pursuits. However, it is thought that Asians are not taught to think independently, outside the box, and that training, that in particular, for that kind of training that is necessary for innovation and discovery. There is, however, a history of inventions in China in particular, and this is gunpowder, the compass, and printing. And old China hands would like to point to the fact that when these discoveries were made, they were not first used for warfare or for conquest. They were actually used for peaceful purposes, such as fireworks and citing graves or determining feng shui and printing, uh, which came to be used to spread the word uh, on Confucius in addition to what was already carved in stone. It actually spread uh, Confucius sayings. And we do see signs of collaboration uh, through science diplomacy. Many institutions as well as uh, governments are practicing this soft form of di diplomacy. In fact, our own State Department uh, has the USAID 
uh, focusing very much on science diplomacy as a major effort. Although it's not collaboration in a way, the iPhone is a very good example of interdependence throughout the world. The materials used for the iPhone have come from all over the world. The phone itself was actually put together in Asia, mainly in China, and the design and concept for it came from the United States. And we now see that people in China are becoming much more critical of what is going on there, critical of the way science is done, as well as how uh, the government is actually run. And here is a blog that came from Bob Cap of the Pacific Council on Inter International Policy on the West Coast, which Bob calls courageous because it provides a vision of political reform for China. This is well worth reading because there are 10 points that this sociology professor feels needs to be changed. And finally, there are many now bi-national meetings as well as international meetings that are going on between international, um, between different countries and uh, Asian countries. Global MD is an organization uh, created in China that runs Sino-American symposia on many different topics related to medicine. And it was interesting because I picked up one of their uh, publications recently and what I found uh, was something very interesting. And that is that many of us in the United States still hold on to colonial and missionary-like views when we deal with countries in Asia. It is not so much arrogance as the lack of sensitivity. In such meetings, such as the one that I looked at, we tend to offer to help Asian countries, uh, to bring them our technical expertise and our ability to educate, um, especially in the postgraduate uh, training. We forget that what Asia is now looking for is really true partnerships on topics of mutual need and that they can share what they have learned as well as take from what we have learned. It's not just a one-way street anymore. So one particular um, topic struck me uh, from one of the Sino-American meetings, and it was really very sensible of this woman with an Asian name from a United States agency, the NIH, talking about the worldview on suicide prevention. This is just to give you an example of what I'm talking about. It's a scientist proposing to work on a subject that is important to the whole world. And what you see here is a map that looks a little distorted to you, but it's actually size for the relative numbers of suicides in each of these countries. So you can immediately see that the Asian countries, India, China, uh, Japan, Korea, uh, Taiwan, are all countries where there are a large number of suicides. And uh, obviously, this would be a good topic to propose in an international collaborative program because they may look at suicide culturally differently from how we look at it, and we can share our issues and also uh, our experience in helping to alleviate this particular problem. I also found from looking at this particular meeting of the Sino-American group that the Asian scientists were citing Western literature and scientists from all over the world. 
And the Western scientists were citing only um, scientists in the, in the published English literature. So we really do have to change our, our way of looking at these collaborations that we have. Now, the future is really hard to predict. And I've said that we must collaborate, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't look after our own, own house as well. If we lo look at the Asian countries more closely, we notice that there is indeed increasing wealth and economic power. They're beginning to throw their weight around um, in their geopolitical intentions, and there is growth in their space exploration, military hardware, and manpower, and nuclear capabilities. And also, they do have some serious internal problems, such as divide between generations and between the rural and um, urban cultures. There is a strong desire in these countries that is becoming very unsettling for ethnic populations uh, who are looking for more independence. Many of the developing Asian countries have the potential to contribute to modern scientific and technical advances, but many of them have to overcome certain barriers um, in order for their full development. In a couple of years ago, uh, Chris Tan and I wrote an article in Science pointing to the barriers to full science development in Asia. And I took some of the major issues. Their education is growing rapidly and they're producing a large number of scientists. But it is so fast and overwhelming for many of the professors who are teaching that the quality of the trainees are indeed suspect. Education fails to maximally prom promote independence and innovative thinking. Uh, this starts from grade school on through a university. And funding is opaque and favors cronyism. Top-down science has been di directed by bureaucrats limited in science and international exposure. But there is a whole new generation, what is so-called the fifth generation, of young leaders who are coming up who really are much more savvy and speak English and know uh, and have international experience. So it is a changing uh, situation in Asia. And uh, there are improvements, and one begins to see nascent programs in science, ethics, and integrity, which is a large problem uh, in Asian countries. So when we look at our own country, even though things are not perfect, all is not lost. And if you compare the GDP and the number of researchers uh, around the world who are involved in R&D, this is in 2010, the light blue United States still shows that we are spending more money in research than uh, any of the other countries. And we belong in the group that have the largest uh, percentage, the largest numbers of our uh, individuals uh, working in research and development. And there's some other things that we should be very uh, proud about in the United States, which is actually quite unique when you take them all together. And I borrow here heavily from David Brooks. He had one, uh, uh, he actually had two editorials in the past year on the Crossroads Nation. We still have a large number of the best higher education uh, facilities. We have available resources and capital for research and discovery. And we do support innovation and creativity as engines of growth. We have the most freedom from corruption and authority of any country I know. 
And there is meritocracy and lack of hierarchy. There is, we are a country of law. There is protection of intellectual pro property. And as a country, as a crossroads nation with the thickest and expansive network, we provide a community, a network of people, of, of, of wires, uh, of social fabric that, no, that not many other countries can match. And we also indeed do have flexible networks and hubs for creativity. I attended a meeting at Chatham House in, in uh, England recently, and I was surprised that the English envied us for our willingness to take risks and make mistakes. And that is another quality about the United States that is really quite unique. And I found the sense of humor and optimism uh, was also a part of what we have. So yes, we can compete. And what are some of the issues in, in the competition if we try to keep uh, ourselves as one of the top leaders uh, in the world in terms of research and development? Well, we have to look very seriously at internationalization of professional workers. Um, we are used to draining the rest of the world of the best brains. However, we now see brain circulation. And many Asians trained in the West are now returning to Asia. I was asked in the 1980s, uh, should we worry about Asia? They are really developing uh, a great interest in research and have all these scholarly achievements. And I replied, I would not worry about China for several generations. It will only happen when we find top researchers in the United States of Asian origin who are at the height of their careers, willing to leave a full-time job in the United States to return to Asia. We are now seeing that. There are not many of them, and my numbers here are soft, 5 to 25 percent. But we are seeing such people, and it is indeed happening. And on top of that, Asian nations are competing with us for the brain circulation of top researchers. They are attracting workers from other countries, and some of the institutions are allowing them, uh, allowing foreigners rather than their own uh, citizens to take uh, semi-permanent jobs. And they're even establishing institutions that speak only English. So it's a wake-up call. And the thing, it should be obvious that what we have to worry about is education, investment in our young. Maintaining the infrastructure of our intellectual hubs and great cities and maximize contributions for our own diverse population, especially women and minorities. I'd like to end by focusing on the workforce we have currently in the United States. This is from 2006, and you can see that Women and minorities make up a large part of our scientists and engineering workforce. However, given this, we find in a very recent report, and this is from Lillian Wu, uh, who uh, did a study through the NRC, supported by the National Academies, on men and women uh, at four-year colleges and universities. And what she has here is a percentage of doctoral scientists and engineers employed in these universities and four-year colleges who are tenured by race, ethnicity, and gender. And this is more recent data from 2008, although there have been some data uh, ever since 2002 uh, that are quite similar. What you can immediately see is that um, Minorities, as well as women, do not succeed 
in, to tenure positions as soon as uh, white men. And what is probably most shocking uh, to many people, because we've never suspected this, is that if we look at the purple line, which indicates Asian men, compared to the green line and the brown line, what we notice is that Asian men have a less, lesser chance of succeeding as, by this measure uh, compared to blacks and Hispanics. And similarly, uh, even worse, uh, when you compare uh, the women in the minority groups, similarly for Asian women, it's uh, a real double jeopardy. Uh, this, uh, these data hold up uh, when one looks at industry as well as a, at government. And I should also add that there's similar data uh, for uh, the legal profession as well. So there will be a loss to America's future global competitiveness should very talented population of Asian Americans, and I do focus on that here because the data are so clear, uh, be overlooked for US policy and scientific leadership. So with that thought, uh, I leave you. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>Thank you very much, David and Alice. Uh, give us lots of food for thought, I think. And we have questions. We're going to take questions in a minute from the audience. There are cards. Do people see cards? Have people gotten cards? No. Oh, we're going to do it with mics. So, uh, so th that means that when you have a question, please come up to the mic, and I will try not to overlook you. Uh, one sentence ought to suffice, and it really ought to end with a question mark. Okay, thank you. But maybe to get things started, I will ask a question to both of, both of you. It's more general, I think, than, uh, than specific to, to your fields. But what do you see as the proper role of scientists in policy? Uh, what I'm thinking of is on a spectrum from one end that just says, just the facts, man, good luck on the policy, to the other end that says, here are the facts and government ought to do X. What say you? Alice, you want to start? No. I'm happy to start. I, I think that obviously uh, we need to be sure of our facts when we uh, make certain statements, uh, but we are human after all, and uh, we have passions about of what we think those uh, facts show us. And I think it's um, important to do both, to cover that spectrum. Uh, but to be clear as to uh, when you are pre presenting just the facts or uh, when you are presenting something that is one's own opinion. You know, I'd like to say that scientists should become heavily involved in policy issues and because policy issues impinge upon the actual production of science in, in lots of interesting ways. But I do know that many of my colleagues, when faced with policy issues, are very naive okay. and that you can't just walk into a room and start giving advice. You've got to have spent time with people, you've got to have thought about it, you've got to have tested your ideas like you do in any other field. And too many scientists, I think, think they're smarter than any socialist. I mean, too many basic scientists think they're obviously smarter than any social scientist. Uh, and so uh, they can tell the social scientists what the real facts of life are. Uh, I, one of the things I learned as president of Caltech was to appreciate social scientists. 
And so I, I think it's the responsibility of the scientific community to be involved in policy issues. They should give the facts, but they also can give their opinions. But they, also, they, they must take seriously that responsibility and understand there's an expertise behind thinking, so, thinking about policy. So just to pick an example, how do you think the science community, how well do you think the science community dealt with the stem cell debate over the last several years? Well, the scientific community had a really tough job in the stem cell debate because there was such a gap between the views of most scientists um, and the um, opposition to st the opposition people to stem cells. There was virtually no opposition within the scientific community. The opposition came from religious communities and uh, ma mainly religious communities. And so the, it was, they were talking across each other. And it was very hard to say the scientists should uh, credit the opinions of, that were coming from a religious perspective, because they really believe that the uh, religious perspective doesn't belong in science. Um, so I'm not sure everybody gets very high marks for that. Uh, and, you know, it's still going on. It, it hasn't stopped. Alice, do you want to add anything to that? I think there's some issues um, that uh, no matter what fact, factual information there are, um, that the differences are so great that there's no crossing that divide. or uh, and. Stem cell is one of them. Another that uh, I've been fighting with in the last few years is uh, uh, research uh, with laboratory animals, uh, which is an issue that uh, I think that um, they're just so difficult. Uh, and people come from it from very uh, personal points of views uh, that are different, and you at times have to say that uh, we agree to disagree. Thank you. Question over here, and then we'll go back and forth. And I can say that I, there we go, I uh, really do have a love for research, but um, from hearing from in the past working in labs and when I'm currently, it's just it's such a tough process moving forward with the education, like, like you said, Dr. Baltimore. So um, it's almost even daunting in a sense. Um, so what advice would you give undergrads here, I see undergrads here, who really do have a heart for research, want to see things move forward, but um, just see the whole process as something you know, almost in our way? What, what would you say in your words of wisdom? Both of you guys. Well, I'll tell you what I do say, because I've, I've run into that question very personally as a professor at a university. And that is, don't go into research unless you can't imagine doing anything else in your life. Uh, when I grew up, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. It's just I was driven to it, and I was luckily oblivious of the <coughs> potential uh, blocks that might be in my way, um, and, I, and I, I just went right ahead. And I think that's what you need to do, and if you love it, then you put up with all of the roadblocks and you'll be successful. And there are people being successful all the time. And you know, the, the universities of America are populated by people of all ages. Those people are gonna retire, particularly the older of them are gonna retire, and there are gonna be jobs available. Uh, so it's not as if uh, there's no opportunity to get into the system, there is opportunity. But it's, we, we, I think it's the responsibility of people in my position, sort of the older position, if you wish, uh, to point out how difficult it's become and how daunting it can be to effectively speak for you, maybe, and to see if we can't jigger the system some so that the times are not so long 
And lots of people at universities now are aware that the times, the time in training is just simply too long. And uh, that the, the uh, wherewithal to get into research is, is available to the best of, of young people. So we're trying to do it to make the road a little easier for you, but, uh, but keep at it. Question over here. Thank you, Dr. Baltimore and Dr. Wong, for coming to speak to us. Um, Dr. Wong, you, you mentioned that uh, we'd like to increase the relationship with uh, the new Asian countries um, through science. Um, I guess I'd like to ask what, uh, they're publishing a lot of articles and doing a lot of research, but how, what is the quality of this research? Because I guess I've, I've heard that um, it, sometimes it's difficult to, to judge whether or not the quality of their research or their standards meet whatever standards we have in the U.S. This is one of the uh, very important issues in Asian countries. And uh, for those of us who come from an Asian background realize that whenever there is uh, fraud or plagiarism per per perpetrated, uh, by an Asian, no matter where they are, that it sort of tars all Asians. And indeed, there have been some very uh, uh, well-publicized frauds. Uh, what we are seeing now is that uh, there's a tremendous amount of research coming out of Asia now. They are publishing more and more each year. and that some of that uh, work is excellent. And science is something that is um, continuing and it's reproduced. And to, for those of us who build on other people's science, and we all do, we have to build on foundations, that if that result can be reproduced, uh, then we know uh, that we can move on with it and that's acceptable. So we just have to depend on that kind of process to be absolutely sure. Uh, and, and luckily, it is uh, self-regulating in, in that way. Question over here. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Wong, uh, you just mentioned the importance of reproducibility in science. Um, but there's a recent study that just came out, I think co-authored by Amgen, that sort of called into question 42 of 55 studies done on uh, cancer drug targets. Um, so, you know, both of you, Dr. Baltimore and Dr. Hong, what are your thoughts on this? Is this a reflection that's endemic to life sciences in general, or is it a one-off, or what can be done about it? I, I should say that I am a director of Amgen, <laughs> and I'm aware of that study. Um, and it doesn't single out Asian papers, it's, it's about the whole literature. And it is extremely disturbing. And it is not just Amgen that's seen this, because I've talked to people at other pharmaceutical companies, and they all say, we are less and less able to trust the literature. And we don't know why. But we've wasted a lot of time, they tell me, uh, trying to reproduce things that, because we wanted to develop them further, because they had great <coughs> implications for, for pharmaceutical development, and then we couldn't reproduce them. Um, that's not everything, but it's a surprisingly large fraction. And the reason you can't reproduce things um, can be on the one hand because they're irreproducible, and the other hand because you can't really reproduce the exact circumstances under which that work was done, or the, the, the reagents, the procedures. Sometimes people have quirks in the way they do experiments that even they don't know about, and so they haven't put them down on paper. Um, but it is, the, the implication is that there's a significant amount of work being done, which is, which is, um, well, which the books are being cooked, and uh, you can't get away from that implication. And the remarkable thing about that, in it, I think it's mentioned in there, 
is that the work from the best journals is the work which is less, least reproducible. Uh, and so you put that together with your suspicions about what's going on, and you come out wondering whether people aren't stretching the truth in order to get into the best journals, and therefore that those papers are the least reliable. That's an awful thing to think about or to say, but uh, I must say that, that that study from Amgen and, and, and what I've heard from others raises that issue. Over here, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Chung Hae Su, and I am an Asian female tenure track faculty <laughs> member here at Rice. And so, obviously, I was very startled by the statistic that you ended with, Dr. Huang. So, my question is what's going on? Is this institutional? Is this cultural? And what can be done about it if something can be done? A lot of us have talked about this and, and asked ourselves the same question. It, I think uh, we don't have all the answers, obviously, uh, because otherwise it would be very easy to say we've got to fix this, this, and this. Um, it's going to be complex, and, uh, and I think that we need to make sure whether the data uh, are in relation to um, Asian Americans who are born in the United States or those who are not born in the United States, uh, if there are cultural issues uh, or language issues, uh, I, I think that we are seeing increasingly a greater number of Asian Americans participating in uh, the U.S. system who are uh, born in, in this country. Uh, it will uh, certainly uh, straighten itself out eventually, and as we see that uh, even Obama is using more Asian scientists um, <laughs> in his administration. But um, the answers are going to be complex. I think that all that we can say is that here are the data right now. We don't understand it, but it says we all have to pay attention to this, and we're wasting a lot of talent. I'll take it. Yes, please. Hi. Um, this question is uh, not directed at anyone in particular, so I'd like to hear both of your opinions. Uh, recently, Republican candidate Mitt Romney has identified China as one of the United States' greatest threats. Uh, however, uh, the uh, National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft was just at the Baker Institute recently and stated that U.S.-China uh, relations should not be thought of in terms of a zero-sum game. I was just wondering, what are the effects of these varying political perspectives on us sino relations and uh, developments in cross-cultural science and technology policy? Well, I would certainly echo what, what Brent Scrocroft said. It should not be considered a zero-sum game. Um, in the best of all circumstances, Chinese science, Chinese research will improve uh, in quality and, and extend over time. Um, and that will be good for the world. The important thing is that we pay attention to our own country and that we improve our, our educational system, that we fund research at a level in which we, it, it can prosper, that we look at the various procedures uh, involved in the funding of research to optimize the ability to get new things done. Uh, that we become competitive. And we should take the rise of China as a challenge to us to um, improve across the board our infrastructure so that we keep our position. We're never going to be dominant in the world of science the way we were after World War II. After World War II, America was really the only country standing and um, we, and because of the remarkable uh, uh, report of then of our Bush, uh, we got a push in the direction of uh, building our uh, building our science, building it into our institutions in an effective manner, so that it could ultimately generate what it has generated, which is the incredible industrial uh, innovation and production that 
that we've seen based in, in modern science after World War II. Uh, there are lots of other countries standing now, and they are determined to take, have their niche in the world, and they're entitled to it. Uh, so if in a steady state, 50 years from now, uh, we're contributing in excess of our population relative to the rest of the world, we will be a success. If we're contributing less than our population, which is a real worry because of the, the small number of, the, because of the state of scientific literacy in the United States, um, then we will be a failure. And uh, it's up to us. Uh, China will take care of itself. You know, for the past uh, century, we've really been, as a country, very schizophrenic about China. <laughs> and uh, you will see this even more so in this year because it's an election year. And it's easy for politicians to use China as a scapegoat for all sorts of things. It also draws together support because of the fear of that uh, bear outside the door. Uh, John Huntsman, who has been involved in Asian policy for many years and is an ex-ambassador to China from the United States, uh, said recently at a meeting that I attended that, that he felt that we needed a whole new group of foreign policy makers who really knew China, understood it, in, especially as it is changing now, who uh, realize that China is getting a group of leaders who are beginning to feel their own oats. They uh, think they understand the Western world better, the international scene, and that they are uh, going to be more difficult to deal with. But we have to understand what, where they're coming from, what they are doing uh, culturally in the sense of the whether they're still saving face or they're not, understanding the sensitivities that go on, and that we are actually in desperate need of training a whole new cadre of Chinese specialists or Asian specialists. Do you want to add anything, David? Okay. Question, My uh, question is a little bit different. Um, I'm actually an MD. I'm at uh, MD Anderson. I'm an assistant professor. When you look at the breed of researchers, there are the pure scientists who are PhDs, they know their love of life, they want to do their science, and then there are MD-PhDs who from, from the very beginning are committed that this is what they want to do, and then there are people like me who are in between because I started as an MD, and somewhere during my fellowship got introduced to basic science and started working with signaling and all that, and I felt like I was a good conduit between the lab and trying to take my findings to the clinic. But when we compete for NIH grants, we are pretty much in the same category, competing for grants for, you know, whether it's me and I'm spending, you know, three days a week in clinic and then running back to my laboratory and trying to do things versus somebody who is completely dedicated to the field or has protected time, so on and so forth. So, what would your um, advice be in terms of how to approach this? And number two, is there a separate category or there should be a separate category for people like me? No, that's a difficult question. Uh, because, well, I'll, I'll quote John Mendelson, who was president of MD Anderson. Uh, in a conversation earlier today who said, NIH is in the business of curing cancer, of preventing AIDS, of dealing with Alzheimer's disease. It's not trying to build the demographics of the country or the, the, the uh, uh, demographics of, of individual. He talked about institutions, but you can make the same argument for individuals. And so I can, on the one hand, say I feel sorry for your position, but it, it's, it's a competitive world. And if you only have two days a week to give to it and somebody else has five days a week to give to it, uh, then they're likely to look better um, to a review group that's, that's giving out competitive grants, especially when we're only giving 
10 percent, or only funding 10 percent of the grants that come in or less. Uh, on the other hand, you say, and I think rightly, that maybe you can bring special uh, understanding to the research you're doing and that maybe you should be protected in some way. Um, but I don't know if you can figure out how you should be protected. I find it a little difficult to figure out how. Um, and so I, I don't have a good answer for you. It, it does raise the issue about whether our peer review process is working as well as we would like it to work, and that would, that would apply to all the federal agencies supporting research. I think that's also an issue with your question. Alice, do you want to add anything on this? Well, I would just add, because this question was asked to me earlier today, and that is that <clears throat> we look to NIH largely for our support, but uh, it may be well worth it to look in other places as well, and, and, and some of... Yeah, that's good. Uh, uh, David had mentioned that there would be, that foundations are beginning, private resources and foundations are beginning to support research more. And uh, very often if you are in a specific disease focus, uh, there are special small foundations uh, that are willing to be supportive. So I would look more widely, definitely, and try to find a niche that, that you might fit into. I think we just have time for the remaining two questions, so please here and then to okay. the right. Um, well, I have a question about science education. Um, as we, as everyone's aware, I'm sure there's been a lot of talk about like education reform politically, and there's a big emphasis on trying to educate students in the most like cost-effective way, even at the university level, especially for public universities. And I wanted to ask. Um, what implications do you think that has for like uh, the next generation of scientists and um, how that will affect like their research? You wanna? I'm not sure yeah. what the question is. Um, if, if we're gonna talk about cost-effective uh, research at the graduate level, um, I am basically very skeptical about whether that's an appropriate approach. Now, maybe I'm just old-fashioned. Uh, again, David Brooks, who writes the most interesting things I read every week, uh, the last week, I think, said that there are two economies in America. One is an economy of manufacturing that is particularly involved in export, and that is becoming incredibly efficient because it's competing with the rest of the world. And in order to be effective, has to do everything at minimal cost and, and greatest effectiveness, in particular with the use of robots and automation. And then there's the economy which is not competitive with the rest of the world because it involves service within our own country. Education and research are two parts of that. Uh, and he was saying that cost effectiveness has to come to those institutions. And I sort of, I, I thought about that for a while. And I find that antithetical to what I believe about education, which is that it is a very low yield, very in personal kind of activity at the graduate level uh, in which one professor is trying to teach one young new investigator how to do this stuff and helping that individual critique his or her own, perform her own performance and trying to make them a member of a professional organization in a, in a really old-fashioned um, uh, uh, Got the word I'm looking for, but um, way. Uh, so anyway, I'm 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 not really very sympathetic towards trying to uh, make it efficient. Um, but you know, once efficiency gets into the equation, it's very hard to get it out. And 
the rest of the country doesn't necessarily see things the way I see them. Uh, so I think we're in for a continual squeeze on the universities and the research enterprise to try to become more cost effective. Last question, yeah, please. Look, looking at the uh, flu uh, epidemic in 1919, in which there was just- 18. Uh, 18, <laughs> in which there was just incredible mortality, uh, does that still continue to be a, a very serious threat in the future? Uh, if so, do we need to devote more research to preventing it from happening, or is that something where we, have, we can only respond after the fact? I, I think uh, we have the ability now and the understanding of something like flu and also of other new diseases that may emerge. Uh, we understand that, that we need to have good surveillance uh, especially with people who deal with animals as well as human health, and that uh, we need specifically to identify sources of new diseases that, that uh, arise and then to try to isolate them. And we have the techniques for handling it, and I would just give as an example uh, SARS, which occurred not so long ago, which uh, seemed to be um, quite deadly and spread throughout China for a period in which it wasn't uh, uh, well identified for several months. And once it uh, began to move out of China as an as a, a epidemic, uh, the world's uh, researchers really got on that very fast. And it was sequenced and identified very quickly. And people were isolated, and I think that we now are in a position in which we can handle many of these uh, diseases, especially influenza. And in addition, there are now um, several potential um, vaccines uh, that we have a handle on, which can be deployed uh, relatively rapidly to protect uh, any potential uh, individuals from exposure. Uh, so that's a, a very general response to your question about flu per se. Uh, Thank you. There, there may be some other strange disease yeah. that we don't know yeah. about that'll come up. <laughs> let me slightly yeah. disagree. You just, <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, good. Well, I think we can continue yes. the discussion then. Okay. <laughs> Fire away. Had the H1N1 um, swine flu been a more serious disease than it turned out to be, the one that started in Mexico and came up in the United States. We could have seen um, millions of people incapacitated, killed by that virus. Luckily, it wasn't so bad. But we did not have in place the surveillance to find it early. We did not have in place the ability to, to uh, uh, isolate people who got it. And if there is a large fraction of transmission which is not causing people to get sick, then you get covert spread of the virus. And you can't actually find out where it is because there are a lot of people getting it and spreading it who are not showing symptoms. Luckily with SARS, almost everybody who got infected had symptoms. And so we could find them down to the last individual and isolate them once we really understood what was going on. But that's not necessarily true of something which, is, uh, uh, which, which doesn't always cause ser serious disease. Uh, now, that's where I disagree. But where I agree that may, we may be on the verge of having the ability to counter a flu epidemic is that I think we're coming to the point of being able to make a universal vaccine against flu. And if we can do that, and this is right on the edge of today's science, if we can do that, then we can provide a stockpile from which we can protect the population if we need to, or we can just immunize everybody and, and, and do away with it. Um, so uh, things are changing very rapidly. Maybe we'll get there, but right now 
if a new flu, a new uh, uh, 1918 epidemic came up, I don't believe we could stop it. So, so I have a last question that people are very curious about, but nobody will ask. Is the Nobel Prize a good thing? I mean, <laughs> that change your life in a positive it, way? It changes your life. I don't know if it's positive or negative. Uh, you suddenly become much wiser than you were before. Uh, <laughs> about everything. About everything, yes. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, the, uh, the, let me seriously answer the question, though. The good thing about the Nobel Prize is that everybody recognizes it. And therefore, once a year when it's given, people are actually focused on what's going on in science. That's a good thing, because no other time do we break through yeah, that veil. Right. Uh, the fact that individuals have to be singled out is not a good thing, because science is not about one guy being better than another guy. It's about a, a huge team effort with contributions from many, many sides. Uh, so the focus on individuals is a little sometimes Liv embarrassing. Living with a Nobel Prize, is that a good thing? I mean. <laughs> it's been a great trip. <laughs> <laughs> Let's thank our speakers. <laughs>